Robert Stewart was born on the 18th of June 1769. As the eldest surviving son of one of Ireland's most prominent political families, his profession, if not the heights he would reach, was in many ways clear from birth. His mother died soon after, and his father, member for County Down in the Irish Parliament, married again five years later. Stuart had a pleasant childhood and was indulged by both his father and his stepmother. The most important influence in his formative years, however, was his step-grandfather, Charles Pratt, later the Earl of Camden. After being schooled in Ireland, Stuart was sent to Cambridge with the encouragement of Camden. There, he excelled intellectually, but left after only a year, likely because of an STD. Having abandoned his studies, he returned to Ireland where he contested a seat for the Irish Parliament in Down. This required enormous expenditure on the part of his family, but the exhaustions proved to be worth it with Stuart's victory. In 1791, he embarked on a brief continental tour, watching the early stages of the French Revolution in Paris, where he was impressed by the eloquency of even minor members of the National Assembly, something he would consistently struggle with in his speeches. But overall, the chaos he saw across the channel began to turn him away from his natural allegiance to the somewhat pro-revolution Whigs in Parliament. Back in Ireland, he operated pragmatically, supporting the government so long as it shunned revolution, but endorsing some reform including limited Catholic emancipation. He was in favour of the war against France, but prepared to criticise its conduct. By this time, again with the support of Camden, he was increasingly coming under the British Prime Minister William Pitt's influence. In 1794, Pitt offered him a seat in Westminster alongside his Irish constituency, which he duly accepted, though for the time being, Stuart continued to see his political future in Ireland. Later that year, he met Lady Amelia Hobart. Stuart had developed into a strikingly handsome man, and though shy, could be a witty and charming conversationalist. Amelia, by contrast, was outgoing but eccentric. In June of that year, he married her, and though it never produced any children, the match was to prove a happy one, with Amelia offering him support throughout his career. In 1796, Stuart's father was made Earl of Londonderry, and he was hence known by the courtesy title of Lord Castlereagh. In 1798, he became acting chief secretary to his step-uncle, the second Earl of Camden, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Camden had leaned on Castlereagh heavily over the previous few years, both for his ability and his local knowledge. For Ireland in the late 1790s was a country on the verge of revolution. Castlereagh had always believed the government of Ireland, dominated by the Anglo-Protestant minority, needed reform to include the Catholic majority, but he was likewise implacably opposed to the revolutionary movement within the country, known as the United Irishmen. The day after becoming Chief Secretary, a proclamation against sedition was announced, followed by strong-arm tactics against the leadership of the United Irish. The abortive rebellion throughout the country that year was successfully crushed, and a French fleet meant to land troops in support was fortunately scattered by a storm. Camden was replaced in Ireland with Lord Cornwallis following the rebellion, who also expressed a high opinion of Castlereagh's abilities and commitment to the British Empire. Both appealed for London to show clemency to the Irish rebels, but were largely unsuccessful. In December that year, Castlereagh was invited to London to discuss a possible union between Ireland and Britain, which he had by this point become convinced was needed in the face of the revolutionary and French threat to his home country. Tasked with bringing it about, Castlereagh was forced to work tirelessly at somehow convincing the Irish Parliament to vote for its own abolition. After persuasion failed, Castlereagh turned to bribery to win over members. Though rightly since condemned, the fact Castlereagh's attempts were so successful is in itself a damning indictment of the state of Irish politics at the time. The debates over the Union were often long, exhausting and bitter. Castlereagh himself had to put up with a torrent of abuse throughout the campaign, at one point being denounced as a sapless twig, a jibe at his inability to produce an heir. Finally, on the 28th of March 1800, the Bill of Union passed, and on the 1st of January 1801, Ireland ceased to exist as a sovereign kingdom. Castlereagh has since been denounced as a traitor to his country, but he always passionately believed he had acted in Ireland's interest, and continued throughout his life to refer to himself as an Irishman. One change in particular Castlereagh hoped the Union would bring about was Catholic emancipation, which he believed would reconcile Irish Catholics to the Union as a force for progress, but he had underestimated the opposition of the King, who viewed it as contrary to his coronation oath. 
and so, much to Castlereagh's dismay, Catholic emancipation was shelved for another 30 years. Now serving only in Westminster, Castlereagh wasn't initially offered a position in cabinet, but was considered a rising star. In 1801, Pitt's government finally fell and was replaced with Henry Addington. Pitt convinced Castlereagh to accept a role in the new government as president of the Board of Control, where he briefly broke with Pitt after tentatively supporting Addington's peace agreement with Napoleon's France. But, with Napoleon not even bothering to hide his violations of the Treaty of Amiens, while still threatening Britain over its continued occupation of Malta, Castlereagh supported a return to war, and once again joined Pitt when he was recalled to power, becoming one of the Prime Minister's closest confidants before his death in 1806. Castlereagh was now made Secretary for War, and tasked with re-energising the fight against Napoleon. Whilst Pitt began building a coalition to fight France, Castlereagh set about reforming the British military. It was outside his office that Horatio Nelson and Arthur Wellesley, later the Duke of Wellington, met for the only time. In 1805, Nelson destroyed a Franco-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar and secured British naval supremacy, but Napoleon just as convincingly defeated Pitt's coalition on land. Castlereagh organised an expeditionary force in the hopes of assisting Prussia when they took the field in 1806, but Napoleon just as quickly defeated them, and enforced his domination over Europe with the Treaties of Tilsit in 1807, by which time Castlereagh was out of office due to Pitt's death. In 1808, Bonaparte blundered into a war with Spain and Portugal. By this time, Castlereagh had largely finished his reforms of the British Army, and having been recalled to office once more, was able to rush troops to Portugal. There, they were led initially by a young soldier named Arthur Wellesley, who without Castlereagh's support would likely have never got the post. Over the next seven years, Castlereagh was Wellesley's most dogged and consistent supporter, as British fortunes ebbed and flowed in the war. His faith was immediately rewarded when Wellesley defeated a French army at Vimiero, but he was then overruled by his new superior, who arranged for the French to be escorted back to Brest by the Royal Navy, forcing both men's recall. Though Wellesley was exonerated at the subsequent inquiry, it was nonetheless embarrassing for Castlereagh, as was the hasty retreat of the British army later that year to Coruña, after a brief advance into Spain. In 1809, continuing Pitt's strategy of building coalitions against Napoleon, Britain sponsored Austria's re-entry into the conflict, in an attempt to support the Habsburgs, Castlereagh planned what would become known as the Volkeren Campaign. The aim was to capture the large port of Antwerp and burn the French fleet stationed there, but when the expedition was belatedly launched, it became bogged down in marshes, and the army was eventually evacuated with 20,000 invalided troops. It was at this point that Castlereagh discovered a plot to oust him from the cabinet, the Foreign Secretary, George Canning, was in many ways a reflection of Castlereagh. Both were Irishmen born within a year of each other, but whereas Castlereagh had been born to privilege, Canning was the son of a poverty-stricken actress that had relied on the charity of a wealthy uncle for his education. Where Castlereagh was often incoherent and dull in his speeches, Canning was considered the most brilliant orator of the day. Both had been disciples of Pitt, but in 1809, Canning had gone behind Castlereagh's back to demand his dismissal from the cabinet. The Prime Minister, the Duke of Portland, had agreed, but had then waited several months without taking action, all the while allowing knowledge of the plot to slowly spread. When Castlereagh finally learned of the plan through an offhand remark, he was furious, resigning from the cabinet and challenging Canning to a duel, where Canning was subsequently shot in the leg. The duel was a national scandal, but public opinion ultimately sided with Castlereagh, who was viewed as the injured party, at least in the dispute if not the duel. Both he and Canning remained out of office for the next three years, though Castlereagh continued to give his support to the war effort. In 1812, Lord Liverpool formed a government and Castlereagh was offered the seals of the Foreign Office, as well as leadership of the House of Commons, which he duly accepted. He reached this high point of his career just as British fortunes began to turn in the war. That year, Napoleon launched an invasion of Russia that ended in the almost total destruction of the Grand Armée, whilst in the peninsula, Wellington liberated Madrid. In 1813, Castlereagh continued Pitt's grand strategy and induced the European Great Powers into a new coalition against Napoleon. The only neutral was Austria, which was managed by its wily foreign minister, Clemens von Metternich. He was eventually persuaded to join the war, and the Allies subsequently delivered a crushing defeat to Napoleon at Leipzig, 
whilst Wellington finally forced the French out of Spain, and in 1814 they invaded France. Castlereagh now faced a serious challenge in keeping the coalition together. The Austrians in particular appeared unwilling to fight the war to the actual dethronement of Napoleon, and seemed liable to make a separate peace with the French. Castlereagh successfully ended this threat with the Treaty of Chaumont, in which all of the great powers pledged to make no separate peace, in return for more British subsidies. On March the 31st, the Allies entered Paris, following which Napoleon finally abdicated. Castlereagh was instrumental in the terms of the resulting treaty between the French and the coalition. France was returned to her pre-revolutionary borders of 1792, but would not face indemnities or any other restrictions, whilst the Low Countries were to be protected by a newly strengthened Dutch Kingdom. Castlereagh ensured Britain kept key colonies such as the Cape and Malta, though numerous others were handed back to either France or the Netherlands. The treaty both restricted France's ability to dominate the continent again, but by preserving her as a great power, Castlereagh ensured the other European states wouldn't challenge British dominance, knowing she was vital if France ever experienced a resurgence. The treaty was lauded in Britain, with even Castlereagh's harshest critics paying respect to the skill in which he had handled negotiations. Later that year, Castlereagh was sent to Vienna to finalise the European peace settlement with the other great powers as the British plenipotentiary. Vienna was in a mood of jubilation, and much of the diplomacy took place against a backdrop of extravagant balls and banquets. Castlereagh and Emily made a particular stir. A police report noted that Lord and Lady Castlereagh go into every single shop, have everything the establishment contains shown to them, and then leave without purchasing a single item. <laughs> Drawing even more attention was Castlereagh's younger half-brother Charles, who had served as a military commissioner to the coalition armies in 1813, and was supposed to assist Castlereagh with diplomacy at the Congress. Instead, Metternich secret police reported Charles spent most of his time in brothels, and usually left so drunk he had to be carried back to his carriage, or alternatively, challenged non-English speaking cab drivers to boxing matches. Despite this, Vienna was another triumph for Castlereagh. Though Parliament was often impatient with the length of the negotiations, he came back with a settlement that created an equitable balance of power on the continent. More importantly for many in Britain, Castlereagh was also able to wring commitments to abolish the slave trade out of the other powers, which even Wilberforce commended as a great achievement. There was much more radical criticism this time, especially of Castlereagh's decision to leave Italy almost entirely to Austrian domination. Even so, considering the circumstances, the Vienna settlement was an undoubted success, begrudgingly admitted by even Canning. In 1815, Napoleon escaped his confinement on the island of Elba and was restored to power in France, followed by a declaration of war by all of the Allied powers. Castlereagh defended the decision to renew the conflict on the grounds of national defence, rather than as a counter-revolutionary measure. This wasn't just framing, in private Castlereagh had little love for the restored Bourbon royal family of France, who he viewed as having created their own problems. Castlereagh's efforts to renew and subsidise the coalition were vindicated though, as was his long support for Wellington at the decisive Battle of Waterloo, where the Duke defeated Napoleon thanks to the timely arrival of a Prussian army. Walter Scott later wrote in an essay on Lord Byron that some radicals saw in Waterloo only the victory of Lord Castlereagh. He successfully restored peace to Europe once more with a new treaty that issued minor punishments to France, but remained fundamentally the same as his previous settlement, avoiding the Prussian wish to castrate France permanently. He famously wrote to Lord Liverpool, It is not our business to collect trophies, but to bring back the world to peaceful habits. Though, he did quietly ensure that Napoleon's abolition of the slave trade, cynically contrived to curry favour with Britain in the Hundred Days, was maintained by Louis XVIII. Even Napoleon was bemused at Castlereagh's magnanimity towards France. The Allies were never more united than in 1815, brought and kept together largely thanks to Castlereagh's efforts. There was one thorn however, building on Castlereagh's earlier suggestion that the Allies should outline their plans to resolve disputes through Congress and cooperation. Tsar Alexander proposed a sacred Christian alliance between each of the Allied sovereigns. Prussia, Austria and Russia signed, but Castlereagh kept Britain aloof privately decrying it as sublime mysticism and nonsense. It would, however, in time become a serious division between Britain and the continent. 
Back in Britain, Castlereagh found himself heavily involved with domestic politics in his role as leader of the House of Commons. The initial public elation after Waterloo had soon turned sour with a post-war economic downturn. An attempt to extend income tax sparked public outrage. The introduction of the Corn Laws kept food prices artificially high, whilst the suspension of habeas corpus in 1817 after an attempt on the life of the Prince Regent made Castlereagh particularly unpopular. His great diplomatic achievements were quickly forgotten. He drank too much, put on weight and suffered with gout. His workload was described as enough to destroy the health of Hercules. In spite of this, Castlereagh continued to quietly pursue a diplomatic solution to the slave trade, paying compensation of £700,000 each to Portugal and Spain in return for their abolition of it in all but a few limited areas, along with a future agreement with France that would allow the Royal Navy to search their ships for slaves, whilst the Netherlands agreed to abolish it unconditionally without compensation. His attention returned to foreign affairs again in 1818 with the Congress of Aix la Chapelle, where the cooperation between the great powers agreed upon in the Treaty of Chamon continued, and a timetable for the removal of coalition troops from France was agreed. He did, however, begin to increasingly withdraw Britain from continental commitments, keeping the country aloof from a proposed alliance aimed at crushing revolutionary movements in Europe. This culminated in 1820 with a state paper that called for non-intervention in European affairs, effectively setting the agenda of British foreign policy until 1914. But domestically, things went from bad to worse. The bloody suppression of a radical meeting in St. Peter's Field, the infamous Peterloo Massacre in 1819, led Castlereagh to defend Lord Sidmouth's legislation outlawing such assemblies, infuriating populists and radicals. With the death of George III in 1820, Castlereagh was once again at the forefront of radical criticism as he attempted to push through an annulment of the new King George IV's marriage to Queen Caroline, a move that was detested by the general public. The death of the Queen in 1821 meant the issue sorted itself, but not before Castlereagh had firmly cemented his unpopularity in the public's mind. Even so, it was generally thought that he was the favoured successor to the Premiership by both the King and Lord Liverpool himself, but it was not to be. By 1822, the immense workload, the constant exertions required to mediate great power disputes, the seemingly never-ending string of unpopular policies that he was associated with, and the deafening criticism that came with them were having a serious effect on Castlereagh's mental health. Always prone to depression, he also became increasingly paranoid, on the 9th of August, he told a baffled King George that police officers were after him for committing the same crime as the Bishop of Cloger, that is to say, homosexuality, though no evidence actually exists of him having such inclinations. The King ordered him to rest, and later that day his friend the Duke of Wellington bluntly told him to see a doctor, after Castlereagh asked if he knew of any conspiracies against him. On the 12th, after resting at his country estate, Castlereagh abruptly got up in the morning and sent for his doctor. Then, with a small penknife, cut the carotid artery in his neck. He was just 53 and left Emily and Charles, who had both worshipped him, devastated. A posthumous diagnosis of insanity cleared the way for a state funeral, and thousands turned out to watch his coffin be carried to Westminster Abbey. But his death was also widely celebrated throughout the country. This perhaps more than anything sums up Castlereagh's tenure in office, a saviour of his country that was nonetheless despised by many of its inhabitants. Castlereagh's legacy is a complex one. Few deny his brilliance in foreign affairs, only matched since by his great rival and successor at the Foreign Office, George Canning, and later in the century by his greatest admirer, Lord Salisbury. Yet he was repeatedly denounced by contemporaries for his good working relationship with continental reactionaries, a reformer on issues like Catholic emancipation, yet he implemented oppressive laws in Britain with perhaps a little too much zeal to have simply been doing his duty as he argued. Not a natural abolitionist by any means, yet no man until Lord Palmerston did more to end the slave trade. His lack of eloquence and long period in government meant Castlereagh never got the opportunity to express his position in his own time, and instead left it to the poetry of Byron to do it for him, far less kindly. What can be said is he was a politician of unusual drive, ability, integrity and vision. Without him, it is entirely possible that the coalition may have fallen apart before Europe was liberated, that peace negotiations may have descended into a new war, or that the slave trade may have continued on unabated for several more decades. Castlereagh was a man of many flaws, but also one of rare genius. <laughs>